I feel really honoured to have been asked to come and spend an hour with the most imaginative people in Bristol. I feel a bit like taking coals to Newcastle or something, but hopefully whatever the low carbon version of that would be. So I'm going to yeah, talk for about 35, 40 minutes and then you, we have questions and see what you want to talk about. Is that all right? Um, so yeah, I'm Rob and I've come up from, what's, what's going on there? So I've come up from Totnes in Devon, uh, which is where I live, uh, but I grew up in Bristol and uh, I lived here for a long time too. My kids were born here and uh, so I'm very fond of it. And I'm only going to show you one graph, but don't worry, and it's just the first one. Uh, but I'm gonna t what I want to talk about is about imagination and why it's so important. And uh, I always like to put it, a lot of my work is really in the context of the climate emergency and that observation that really everything we associate with humanity from the emergence of agriculture to the pyramids to Stonehenge to Nina Simone all kind of emerged within this band where we were about 350 parts per million and the temperatures stayed within this particular band. And what we've done over the last 60, 70 years really is to bust very firmly out of that band into something that nobody really knows. We're up to about 420 parts per million now and heading for three degrees. And it's really, uh, really the kind of existential challenge that we have now. And I always say to people, if you're not regularly terrified about climate change, you're not paying attention. And it needs to be the thing that really, really underpins uh, the work that we do. And so for me, I always think about, well, what are the stories that people tell now about where we go from here? Because there's various stories kind of in our culture. There's the kind of Elon Musk version that we're going to have this kind of techno explosion we're all going to go off and live in space and that we can solve everything with technology because we're so completely brilliant i always think mars would be a really shit place to live because there's no trees i can't really see the appeal there's what people call techno stability that idea that we can keep running an industrial growth based consumer society we're just going to run it on solar panels and have electric cars instead i think the challenges that we face go much much deeper than just imagining we can do that there's a very strong narrative uh, around through deep adaptation and the collapsology movement that actually we're about to see uh, this sort of collapse of absolutely everything and what i've always been interested in is this bit is this idea that actually we could design a pathway away from the amount of energy that we use to a much more uh, low energy use but more local more resilient kind of a, a, a model and that which actually ends up being a better place than where we started from now so for me what I've always tried to do when I was a permaculture teacher through the transition movement has been to say actually we need to uh, that we need to be able to sort of tell stories about what a really much lower energy lower carbon society would be like that are so delicious and magnificent and wonderful that we've that's what we run towards rather than feeling like we're being dragged away from something that's somehow kind of uh, irreplaceable and uh, the institute for the future in america have this beautiful on their windows they say any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous which i love and I, a while ago, I, I went to speak at a conference in Switzerland of 400 young people all interested in organic food and organic agriculture. And the guy before me was from one of the big supermarkets in Switzerland. And five times in his talk, he said, and I really urge you to be as pragmatic as possible. You must be really pragmatic. And when I got up, I said, please don't be pragmatic. The last thing we need is, is, is being pragmatic. What we need is people who aren't afraid to be coming out with the really ambitious ideas that are a bit ridiculous. Because we've left this so long that the time for moving in little, little steps is kind of over. We need really bold thinking that's really imaginative and playful and creative and a bit ridiculous. And we, I think we need to be prepared to wear that as a badge of honor. If someone says, what a ridiculous idea, you say, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, this is a picture that I love from the late 1960s where in America, where when people went to the beach, the beach was just, everyone parked their cars on the beach. And that was kind of how it was. And so shortly after that was taken, something changed to say, wouldn't it be nicer if we all went to the beach and it wasn't covered in cars? But you can guarantee, and I think we can all agree now that it is nicer to go to a beach that's not all covered in cars, but you can guarantee there will have been people then who said, but I can't imagine going to the beach and not parking my car on the beach. So the fact that people can't imagine something is no reason why we shouldn't do it. 
You know, we get stuck in this thing that we're... So Mariame Kaba, an amazing prison, ab prison abolition activist in America, she says, we live in a system that has been locked into a false sense of inevitability. So many of the institutions that should be driving this change are just kind of stuck. And uh, imagination is really important to that. So recently, the United Nations published this report. They said, we now, there's no chance of staying below one and a half degrees unless we see a rapid transformation of society. So all of the newspaper articles and headlines all led with, oh, well, 1.5 is finished. None of them said, why don't we do a rapid transformation of society? Wouldn't that be great? It's not like it's working really fantastically as it is at the moment anyway. I think we can do a bit better than that. So, so, I, so that's really what a lot of the work that I do is about, is about, well, how, let, let's do that rapid transformation of society thing, and let's make that the most exhilarating uh, option that, that we have. So I was really inspired in the work that I do by this T-shirt that I saw this young woman wearing at the Black Lives Matter protest in Washington. It gave me goosebumps. I've been to the future, we won. I think how different would our activism be around climate or whatever it is if actually when we talk about it, we come from that perspective. If we're going to do this because there's so much sort of defeatism and like we, we all campaign for stuff, but we don't actually believe very often that it's going to work. I recently read a survey in America that said 70% of the people now agree that climate change is urgent and we need to do something about it, but only 15% actually think we can do anything about it. So we've let, it's a bit like waking up in the night smelling smoke and just ringing your insurance company and saying, my house is fucked. You know, actually, there's a bit in the middle where you actually do something about it. You go and get the fire extinguisher and you do something. So uh, for me, if we just try and engage people by talking about extinction and collapse, it's not enough. We have to be painting dreams and visions that are beautiful that people want to run towards and that they really want to make uh, happen. So I was up at the XR protest in London. I made my own I've been to the future. We, we won sign. I was up for the, uh, for the big one up in London on the weekend. Oops. So this is uh, somebody who's really inspired a lot of the work I do. It's a woman called Rashida Phillips, uh, who's in North Philadelphia. And to me, she's kind of a bit like a superhero. So in the daytime, she's a, a lawyer working in, uh, com in communities in the north of Philadelphia who are being gentrified out of their neighborhood. And she's a housing rights lawyer. And at nighttime, she runs a thing called Black Quantum Futurism which is all about reconnecting with the future and telling stories about the future. She does events not where she gathers oral histories, but where she gathers people's oral futures. And, uh, and I think, and she sees that, that we need to really awaken in people different ideas and different visions and then go and actually make them happen. And she talks about time in a really interesting way. She says, in the Western notions of time is very linear that we go from past to present and to future, and it's a very linear process. And we end up thinking there is a future in front of us, and we kind of know what it's going to be like. She says, actually, in more kind of traditional African understandings of times, it's more like a wheel, that we're in the middle, and there's loads of different routes into different futures that we can access. You know, it's like, so, so for me in the work that I do, it's about, well, yes, there is the future that we're told is that's where we're going, but actually maybe there are different futures we can access. So, so the exciting and top secret news I'm going to be sharing with you today is that in Totnes, we've actually been developing uh, a time machine. We've actually built the UK's first fully functioning time machine. It's a top secret research project. And uh, this is my colleague Kit, and together we, we travel uh, through time with this thing. We, we worked, had to work very hard to build the disbelief suspenders. They're now really, really good. And the, and the cynicism overrider circuits that we had to create. So we have actually built a fully functioning time machine. Ooh, ooh, thank you. Yeah, so, and, uh, and, and with it, we, we go off and we, we visit different places in the future and we also make recordings of what it sounds like because it feels like, well, if we could bring back and play to people what that future sounds like as a really immersive thing, I think it would really shift our sense of what's possible. So what I want to do with you this afternoon is to tell you, share an adventure that we had recently on a journey into 2030. You might think of me as the kind of Marco Polo of climate change or the sort of uh, Phineas Fogg around the world in 80 days coming back with a tale of an, of an adventure that I went on to tell you about. So we started no, we didn't do that. So we started uh, with our time machine parked up in this street here uh, in 2023, and then we had to set the dials and, the, and the, 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 the valves and stuff. And then when we arrived in 2030, it looked like this. You know, that actually the, the future that we were traveling towards was not a utopia. It's not a dystopia. 
but it's the future that we could create if we did absolutely everything that we could possibly have done. So those seven years we traveled through between now and then were a time of extraordinary, felt like we lived through a revolution of, Im of the imagination. Things that felt impossible in 2023, built and built. And then this was the world that we stepped out into. And my friends, the bicycle rush hour of 2030 was the most beautiful thing to behold. Like a, like a, a river of bicycles going past. And when you stood and listened to them going past, it wasn't just the same sounds. It was people in conversation with each other, children cycling with their friends, people having conversations on the phone, people with their headphones on listening to music, singing loudly like it's karaoke because no one's going to hear you anyway. And if they do, you're not going to see them again in about 10 seconds. So it was this whole kind of cavalcade of people going past. This was, uh, this was in Bristol in, in 2030, where for some reason, I'm not quite sure what happened, but all the street signs are now in Dutch. Something happened around 20. 27 that nobody wanted to talk about but anyway so now when you head into the cities when now in 2023 you get all these like for the car parking spaces how many spaces there are you get that for bicycles now because so many of the underground spaces that we've given over to cars back in 2023 we didn't need them anymore because the number of cars had fallen so much so those spaces were being repurposed as places for people to store their bicycles uh, in a place that was safe and clean and beautifully and really, really well organized. And this had happened because there had been a realization by the government that for every billion pounds you spent building cycling infrastructure, you actually saved 38 billion pounds off the National Health Bill. And so that kind of thinking had come to define how we, how we thought about it. We realized it actually cost less to give homeless people somewhere to stay than to give them all the support that we don't even give them to be homeless. So that kind of economic model uh, shifted a huge amount. And our bike, bicycling is just a completely normal way of doing everything. We've, one of the things that happened as well, people have started writing French on the windows as well. For, I don't know quite. Very international Bristol is now in 2030. Uh, was that in 2024, uh, most of the big, the worst kind of speculative, gambly banks all kind of collapsed. And this time we didn't bail them out. And instead we nationalized them and we bought them and their resources in to driving the process towards uh, decarbonization with a kind of national Marshall Plan, Green New Deal. And so it meant that a lot of those buildings that were occupied by banks weren't really needed anymore to be occupied as banks. And they're now used by all kinds of different co cooperatives and social enterprises and the upstairs converted into social housing, co housing co-ops with food growing on the roof. It was fantastic to go and visit all that stuff forests on the on the on the balconies and stuff supermarkets a lot of the supermarkets you don't see so many supermarkets now and actually many of them have been repurposed as places that are home to all kinds of different local food businesses whereas before this was just one big business this place is now home to about 40 different businesses who are much more embedded in the local economy and one of the things that was really exciting to see, because it was something that I talked about a lot in talks seven or eight, nine years before then, was that now building new buildings using more local materials that haven't traveled huge distance is just completely commonplace now. We don't build with so much concrete because in 2023, 9% of all the CO2 emissions in the world came from the cement industry. So now we build using local materials. We went to visit this tower block that was built nine-story apartment block built using local timber if you stood on the roof of that building you could see where that wood came from so we'd built this whole new economy of people using timber and straw and clay uh, and hemp to build very energy efficient buildings very affordable buildings uh, for people to live in it was and it, so that was a huge transformation for local economies and also there was a huge because there were less cars communities had done a lot more taking their streets back and getting the cars out of the streets. This was one street that we visited where people were very proud to show us a picture of what that street had looked like in 2023. And now it looked like this. And because we realized during that summer of 2022 that in cities when the temperatures get above 36, 37 degrees, concrete and tarmac kill people. They hold so much heat in cities and make them just unbearable places to live. So by 2030, this big push of getting rid of concrete and tarmac, now the biggest businesses in the city are, are people who are taking up concrete and tarmac. Bristol now has about half the concrete and tarmac it had before, so it's much more able to absorb water, much more space uh, for the natural world. This was a beautiful thing to see. So looking back, like what, what was happening in 2023 that meant that where, where could we see the seeds of this shift in 2023? I think one of the ways was that artists and really creative people were getting involved 
in kind of cultivating longing. You know, the arts, you guys all know this better than me, the arts is so beautiful and powerful at cultivating longing in people for a different future. We can't do this without artists. And uh, I read a quote today by um, a guy called Don, Don Delila, who wrote a novel called Underworld. He said, longing on a large scale is what makes history. Longing on a large scale is what makes history. So people were already starting to do that. This is a guy called James Mackay at the University of Leeds who started drawing the future. He said, if our cities became the most biodiverse places they could possibly be, what would that look like? What would that, a picture like that, you can, almost, you can almost taste it. And he started drawing, well, you know, as we take cars out of our cities, what, what happens in that space? Two thirds of the surface area of Los Angeles is dedicated to cars. That's a lot of space. What else could we do with that space? We could turn it into gardens like this and completely reimagine our cities and, uh, and what they're for. So these ideas were starting to percolate. In Barcelona, where in 2022 the municipality closed 30% of all the streets in the centre of the city to turn them into forests, because if you plant trees like that in a city, it lowers the air temperature by about eight degrees. And they used computer pictures like this to sort of sell that idea to people of streets for people, streets for nature, places where people don't overheat, basically. And one of the things as well that really fed into it was that, was that people's activism started to change around this idea of that the key role of, of activism is to cultivate longing for a different future. This was uh, Extinction Rebellion in April 2019 when they closed Waterloo Bridge for the week and turned it into a forest. Put trees all down the middle and I've met quite a few people who worked around there and who crossed that bridge every day when it was full of cars who said, I stopped on that bridge and I thought, why can't it always be like this? It gave, I call it a pop-up tomorrow. They created a pop-up tomorrow. They took that future that we long for and dream for and gave it a physical form. And I've met quite a few people who gave up their jobs as a result of that and went off and who now work in kind of climate sustainability stuff. So that idea of creating pop-up tomorrows, I think, is really, really important. And recently in, uh, in um, Trafalgar Square, there was a group of people who rewilded Trafalgar Square for the day to give people a taste, like how could you take a place in Bristol that people know really well and just for the day or for the week, just turn it into what it is that, 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 that you really want the future to be. I think that kind of activism is so powerful and really touches people in a very different way uh, than, than, than things are often done. So, meanwhile, back in 2030, we visited this whole neighborhood, this, which is uh, this completely car-free city now. We're now designing cities and neighborhoods, so there's no even a space for cars. This is a place where all the buildings, very energy efficient, lots of trees, lots of green. You can, you can park a car outside the house to drop stuff off, but then you have to go and put it somewhere else. So these streets are so safe and quiet and beautiful and cargo bikes everywhere. Three-year-olds riding bicycles, not something you really see very often back in 2023. And uh, this, although there is a car here, so you pretend you don't see that. I think they, <laughs> I think they keep that one like as a sort of uh, like to, a sort of museum piece thing, just to remind the kids about how it used to be. But I mentioned at the beginning that one of the reasons why we go to 2030 is to make recordings of what it sounds like. So I just want to play you a one-minute little audio recording. Of, uh, of what Bristol, the center of Bristol, sounds like in 2030. is a mixture of uh, trams and bicycles and children playing in the street. It lasts about a minute, so you might like to close your eyes and imagine that you're in the Bristol of 2030.
So yeah, so we, we do quite a lot of the, I'll, I'll, at the end I'll tell you what we do with some of those recordings, but I go and make a lot of those kind of recordings. I hope you enjoyed that one. So again, as I mentioned, a lot of the underground spaces that were put over the car parks aren't really needed anymore. So as well, a lot of them are now being used to grow food. Uh, this is a place that we visited uh, under Bristol now, where lots of the underground car parks have been turned over to growing mushrooms for medicine, for food, for uh, leather substitutes, all those kind of things that you can do with mushrooms. A big source of new employment now, uh, growing mushrooms underground. And one of the shifts that happened as well, this is a school that we went to visit, where the kids were asked to design the school. So the kids, what would, people, what would a school look like if it was designed by the kids? Well, it looks like this. And it's covered on the outside with this mixture of cork and clay that basically gives a, top, a surface that's very similar to the outside of a tree. So the whole outside of the building develops this sort of uh, microbacteria, sort of wild mix on the outside. And, uh, uh, and it's quite an extraordinary thing. And it has a rainforest in the middle. So I, I've done a few things in schools and said, what would you like school to be like? And in every place they said, we should have a rainforest in the middle. There's a guy who's a, 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 an indigenous elder in America who says, uh, um, cities are great, but they should, have a, they should always have a rainforest in the middle. And uh, uh, so yeah, so actually when you let people through really creative processes and children design the spaces they want to be in, they come up with things that are very, very different than what we were designing and building back in 2023. Agriculture has, has shifted hugely as well. People realise that actually we needed a lot more trees involved in agriculture to keep the, the, the moisture in the ground, to build the biodiversity, to keep the soil doing well. So agroforestry has exploded, keeping ground cover, having trees in crops uh, in alleys like this particularly in warmer climates, keeping the soil covered all the time, has led to a huge kind of return of biodiversity, which people didn't think was going to happen. And one of the things that really made a big difference here was that we developed the humility to recognise that beavers are much, much better hydrological engineers than human beings could ever possibly be. And we just let them have a go at the uplands and they redesigned them all as ponds and, 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 and lakes and dikes and the biodiversity has just exploded in those places. And we don't get floods anymore because that water stays and moves much more slowly through those uplands uh, in a way that's just fantastic. And I do, I didn't have put it in here, but we went to record uh, what, the, uh, what, that, what the beaver ponds sound like. And you'd think, well, it would, what, would, what would it even sound like? But because when you reintroduce beavers into a place like that, what happens is that the fish population just explodes and they're about eight times bigger than they were before the beavers came. You just sit by the pond and you just hear fish going plop, plop, jumping in and out of the water. It's beautiful. Why does, why does the fish not go to the Sorry? Why uh, well, one of, the, one of the things people often have this idea, well, apparently, so one of the worst things for beavers in this country was the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe books. Because everybody, everybody reads those books, and at the end of the books, your impression is that basically beavers eat fish. And beavers don't eat fish, they eat trees, they eat wood, pulp. So, so anglers get completely freaked out when they hear beavers are coming. But when you reintroduce beavers, what happens is that the, 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 the guy who showed us around this, a guy called Chris Jones, this is down in Cornwall, is he said that when you have a... Uh, a, a, an ecology like this is like a little bonfire and when you introduce beavers it's like you throw petrol on the bonfire so the populations of bats went from four to ten they had birds nobody had seen there for 40 years came back the insect population exploded which is why the fish population because there's more fish for them because the water is it's kind of that thing you're reintroducing a keystone species into an ecosystem and then everything benefits from that really yeah they're amazing go and see beaver i'm so in love with beavers uh, it's, it's ridiculous. Did you know, did you know beavers, their, their front two teeth are orange uh, uh, because they've evolved so that the, they're orange because they have loads of iron in the front of their teeth. The, the, uh, this is very boring. This is, this is beaver geek stuff, but I, I thought it was really interesting. So because the back of the enamel on the back of their teeth doesn't have iron in it, which means that when they chew wood, they always keep a sharp chiseled edge on their teeth because the front wears down slower than the back. So they've always got that edge. Is that interesting? I thought it was, I thought it was really interesting. <laughs> anyway, but this, this is a place called Woodland Valley Farm near Laddock in Cornwall. And you can go there during the summer. And dusk is when they kind of come out and are most active. It's the most magical thing, if you've never seen beavers in the wild before, to see a new big mammal in the landscape you grew up in is just the most magical, amazing, amazing thing. 
Uh, again, another thing about 2030, we went to lots of places where citizens' assemblies are now just the standard way of, of, of making big decisions at a national scale, at a local scale, at a, at a city scale, where you're really inviting people's mature decision making, their deep listening, and as a result, the decisions people make are much, much better and much better digested. And many cities now have something that was inspired by this, which started back in, in Bologna back in about 2013, which is called a Civic Imagination Office. In Bologna back in 2013, they noticed a real decline of people being involved in local democracy, participating less, getting involved less. So they started a civic imagination office where they would run big, really well facilitated visioning things like this using open space and stuff. But then the brilliant bit was that when people came up with good ideas, the municipality would sit with them and say, that's a good idea, let's make that happen. We can offer this and this, you can offer that, let's make a pact. So the citizens and the municipality made pacts together to do things. And this concept of a, civ a civic imagination office has now spread to every town and every city and has been vital because what it does is it invites people to be imaginative and then helps them to make that a reality. So then people think, well, we imagined that, what else could we do? And you get this kind of build-up of self-belief, which was really, really lacking uh, way back in 2023. Universities are really, really changed. This is a university we went to where now there's no lawn left around. Back in 2023, loads of universities were surrounded by acres of grass that served no purpose at all. They're now all uh, put down to food gardens. Students learn that every university declared a climate emergency. Every course is now taught through the lens of the climate and ecological emergency. So you leave any course ready to roll your sleeves up and get involved in doing what needs to be done. So this university now is surrounded by food growing. Every time the university builds a new building, the students a part of building it. They learn how to build using local ecological materials. This is one that we went to that used loads of old car tires, this earth ship model using local clay and timber and hemp and lime to build new buildings. So people, it's much more applied and hands-on and people leave thinking, do you know what? I think we might just do this and I've got, the, I've got the wherewithal to make that happen. And one of the things that unlocked a lot of this back in 2023 was uh, something that started in Camden. Camden was the first council to declare a climate emergency, although I was just told that Bristol was the first council to declare a climate emergency. Maybe they declared it on the same day, I don't know. Or <laughs> both of them claim to be the first council, I don't know quite. Or maybe Bristol was the first city council and Camden was the first, anyway, you know what I mean. So anyway, so Camden also were the first one to do a citizens assembly on climate change. And then off the back of that, they do all sorts of interesting things. They started an imagination hub uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in Camden. They're now running a, a, a training called Imagination Activist Training with all their staff because they recognise that any organisation that is going to have the, the, the flexibility and the capacity to be imaginative on the scale that the climate emergency demands us to be needs to make space for that, needs to change the culture so that the people who say, well, what if we did that? Or who came up with the ridiculous ideas aren't sort of patronised and laughed out of the space, but actually are really kind of welcomed and appreciated and we build on that, creating that sort of yes and culture that you get in, in improv. So this training has now been run in 2023, was run in Camden. It's now run everywhere. Every business, every organisation does that because imagination needs space and we have to make the space within our organisations for that to happen. We visited this place where the, where the municipality bought land on the edge of the town, compulsorily purchased it to create a food garden. And that food garden now produces 80% of all the food eaten in all the schools in that place. And uh, the kids from the school come out and get involved in growing. The, the, the way the food is cooked in the school has really changed. But what they found that nobody had anticipated was a whole cultural shift that happened within the community there. 60% of parents in the school started to change how they cooked, started to change their relationship with food, where they got the food from. And, uh, and that model then spread all over the place. Now, all those companies who would just buy the contract to provide schools, uh, school food are all gone. And it's a very different model that runs now. And every city now has, oh, this is a, a place that we went to where the municipality had taken up all the concrete and tarmac around the, the, the social housing so that everybody could grow food there. And this is an amazing city in Belgium called Liège, where back in 2014, if any of you can remember back that far, uh, they had a, um, the, the, the transition group there came up with a question where they said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? Such a beautiful question. 
And then I went back in 2018, and by then they'd already raised 5 million euros of investment from local people to start 27 new cooperatives in that city. They'd started a farm, two vineyards, a brewery, uh, these, a whole load of shops in the centre of the city. By 2023 already, that model had spread to six other cities in Belgium, and by 2030, it's just the completely the new normal everywhere. Every city now is building a food belt around it to reconnect it to the land around. So those relationships between the city and the land around it have really, really changed. And then lastly, renewable energy. The UK is now 100% renewable energy, and a lot of that is in community ownership. And in, in Bristol, the Bristol Energy Cooperative, which was a real pioneer back in the early 2020s, uh, has now, is now massive in terms of that the majority of renewable energy generated in Bristol is in community ownership, owned by the people of the city who then benefit from that. And it's been a really, really important shift. So I guess the important thing to say is, as William Gibson said, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So to come back to 2023 for a moment, all of those places that I've told you about already exist. We're not waiting for someone to invent some magical bullet, uh, magic sort of piece of technology, the killer app that's going to tackle the climate emergency. Actually, all these things already exist. That's a street in Amsterdam. That's in Utrecht in Holland. Go to Utrecht, see the bike rush hour if you, if you want to restore your faith in the future. This is in, uh, in, in Switzerland, an old bank that's been repurposed. That's in Rotterdam. These buildings are in Grenoble in France. The school designed by kids is in Madrid. This is a street I visited in Switzerland. The car-free neighborhood is in Freiburg in Germany. It's called the Vauban. It's 3,000 people with no cars. It's incredible. This is in Paris. The underground mushrooms where the mayor of Paris about five years ago said we're, we're, the, the, because the, all the measures they've been bringing in to promote cycling and reduce cars, there were loads of underground car parks that nobody needed anymore. So they ran a competition for alternative uses and one of them was people growing mushrooms. Uh, this was uh, um, an agroforestry project I visited in France. That's my phone ringing, sorry about that. Um, this is uh, the Civic Imagination Office in Bologna. This is at Liège University. That's in Luxembourg, and these two things are in Belgium and France. So all of these things are already here. So a lot of what I do is, is I go to places and I make recordings, and, and then I work with this amazing uh, ambient music artist called Mr. Kit, and then we build, we're doing a project called Field Recordings from the Future, where we try, which is about how do you use music and art and all the stuff that you're much better at than me to cultivate a kind of nostalgia for the future. How do we make people nostalgic for that kind of a future feels really, really important to me. So this is a video we made for one of the tracks in an underground mushroom farm uh, in Brussels. And then I'm also working with a Belgian, amazing Belgian cartoonist to do a comic book of our journey to 2030 uh, and what happened when we got there. Because for me, what I find is the more time you spend imagining that, the more it comes into focus. The first time you do it, it's like, well, I don't know, there's maybe less cars or something. But the more you do it, you kind of get down into the detail of, well, what are the headlines in the newspapers? What do you see in the shop windows as you walk around? You know, and that's what we need to be doing, finding those ways, I think, to really uh, nurture and cultivate that kind of longing. So I just want to finish off by telling you about this, because I did a lot of research a couple of years ago about imagination and the state of health of our collective imagination. And could it be that at the very time when we need to fundamental, where our survival depends on our capacity to reimagine everything, that our collective imagination muscle, which should be like this, has actually become a muscle like this. And that's a real problem. And uh, because we know that the part of the brain the imagination fires from the hippocampus is also is the part of the brain that is most vulnerable to cortisol. So when we are anxious or in trauma or stressed, people who have PTSD often have a hippocampus about 20% smaller than it would otherwise be. And when that happens, people often lose the ability to think about the future in hopeful and positive ways and get stuck in the present and stuck in the past. And it feels to me like in 2023, we've perfected uh, an economy and a culture that is deeply damaging uh, to the human imagination creates the perfect conditions to flood us with cortisol most of the time. And uh, so I wanted to try and find a place where they were actively trying to rebuild people's hippocampus, where they were actively trying to rebuild people's imagination. So I went to Dundee to an amazing project in Dundee called Art Angel, which is on the first floor of an office block uh, in the middle of Dundee. They work with people with mental health problems, burnout, stress, exhaustion, trauma. They say, when you come here, you're not a patient, you're not a client, you're an artist, 
preparing work for an exhibition. And every year in the biggest gallery in Dundee, they put on an exhibition of everybody's work. And everybody knew I was coming and why I was coming. They were very, people were very happy to tell me their stories. I spoke to one guy who'd worked in local government for 30 years, had big burnout, collapse of his self-esteem. And uh, he was doing this painting, painting lots of dots, different colors on this picture. And I said, so do you think of yourself as an artist? And he paused and he said, aye, why not? <laughs> and you could see people kind of reimagining and rebuilding who they are. There was, I spoke to this young woman who said, well, I've got a partner who I love and two small children. And six months ago, I came that close to taking my own life. And since I've been coming here, I can see the future again. I'm wanting to do this, I'm wanting to do that. It's really an extraordinary place. And this is Rosalie Summerton who runs that project. And when I was there, she showed me a, a big pile of, of papers that they had done where every year, to evaluate, to show their funders how well they're doing and the impact they're having. They don't give their artists like a questionnaire. They give them a piece of paper with two silhouettes of a human body and they say, fill the first one to show how you felt before you came here. And then fill the other one to show how you feel now you've been coming to Art Angel for a while. And I looked at a big pile of these. It was very, very uh, moving. I just want to show you, I just want to show you one. Because for me, I, I, I feel like what we have to do is to reconnect people, which you do so amazingly, to reconnect people with that imaginative part of themselves, which gets kind of uh, sort of knocked out of us during school. I spoke to a researcher who did research for 30 years with kids th age three to five. She said, I, I, evaluating their levels of imagination, she said, I didn't see any decline over the last 30 years. Something happens when kids get to about six and it just tanks. And it's, very, and it's really very destructive. And so I think when I look at this, firstly, I see this is what it feels like when we reconnect people to their imagination. And secondly, if we do everything that the climate scientists are not just telling us to do, are pleading with us to do uh, over the next five, 10 years, actually, if we get it right, it'll feel like this. It, could f it needs to feel like we lived through the most exhilarating time in history, like we lived through a revolution of the imagination. So this is the picture that gets me out of bed every morning uh, to do the work that I do. So that's all I was going to say. Just to say, if you want to find out anything else about me, I do a podcast called From What If To What Next, which you can find, what do they say, everywhere you get your podcasts, isn't that what people say? Or, uh, there's a, or through Patreon, and there's some books and some other bits. But so thank you very much for your attention. And over to you. Thank you. This is the most beautiful imaginative space I think I've ever given a talk in as well, by the way. It's beautiful. So, yeah, any reflections or thoughts or questions? Yes, at the back. Um, that's a good question. Did you hear the question at the front? Yeah. So, um, oh, but maybe people online didn't hear. So, there, so the question was, uh, if you dig up the concrete and tarmac, what can you repurpose it as? Um, I spoke to somebody a while ago who, who, there are people who have businesses where they go in with a big crunching machine and crunch it into make replacements for gravel or replacements or whatever. It's quite energy intensive, I think, the amount of energy you need to do that. But I think that is, that, that's one way of doing it. The other thing is, um, uh, years ago, I was very involved in, in what people call the natural building movement. So people building straw bale houses and cob houses and all that sort of stuff. And there they talk about, they call broken up concrete uh, urbanite. And they use it just, and they use it to build foundations for buildings in ways like, where, like you, you would use dry stone for doing dry stone walling. You sort of get it down to sizes people can lift and then you just use it to build foundations and mortar them together in that way. I mean, it's, it's a problem we're going to need to figure out because we're, we've an awful lot of concrete buildings in the world which are all going to start sort of uh, failing and we need to figure out other uses for them, so, yeah. So the question was, if there was one thing we could focus on to make our lives and the world a better place, what would it be? I think that's really hard because we're all different. We're all different people. And, and it's the thing that I've learned. So, so the work that I do with the transition movement, which, which started down in Devon in 2006, 
and you can now find transition groups in 50 countries around the world. The thing that I've learned there is that actually what what drives people to do things is that it's the thing that they're passionate about. If you can harness what people are passionate about, and we're all passionate about different things. So for some people it's going to be to do with land, for some people it's going to do with energy, the places where people make a local currency, is because there are people who, are really, who really care about it. I feel like maybe one of the things that, that we can all do that is really kind of good service to our imagination, if you like, is to... Um, like, if all we get coming in on the social media feeds that we've set up for ourselves is just relentlessly miserable, depressing, awful, uh, ghastly news, then I think it's very easy just to get stuck in a sort of, a, in, a, in a place of despair. But there are places like Positive News Magazine and We Are Possible and the Transition Movement who are putting out stories of what's happening. Because everywhere you go, there's amazing things happening. We just never hear those stories. So I think that's one thing we can do is to just give ourselves the you know give ourselves some food some nourishment of, of kind of good stories of, of change that's happening um, in that future which sounds great by the way i'd like to hear that um what <laughs> i can see the shift from a sort of capitalist economy i guess a bit more donor economic or that allows because you were talking about the school and not taking the contract, that's a total shift in how we operate. Yeah. How do we get there? How do we get there? <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's the slightly tricky bit, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I was really, I, I just gave, before I came here, I gave a talk at Ashton Gate Football Stadium, which even though I grew up in Bristol, I've never been to Ashton Gate because all my friends were Bristol Rovers uh, fans. So, was, so I felt like I'm hoping none of them could see me going in here. But... Um, uh, but, at, but at the end, there was a woman who asked me this question. So, so in 2030, is there this? Is there, it was like, it was really nice. It was like they'd sort of got into this headspace of like, yeah, you have actually been to 2030. <laughs> and uh, we completely bought into that. So tell us, you know, is, 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 uh, is Great British Bake Off still going? <laughs> you know, all that sort of stuff. I mean, the, of course, it, it, I mean, like I mentioned, I was just up in London for the, for the big one up in London over the weekend, which was amazing. But I think that, that kind of what next question is just running through everybody in these movements now. You know, it's like you've had Just Stop Oil, Insulate Britain, you've had that sort of really sort of non-violent direct action stuff going on. You've got all the new economy stuff, all the social justice organizations coming out and, and it's just like, it's just not shifting. So uh, I guess for me, my, my sense is that, um, that the way that we got there was a mixture as I mentioned, in the, that, that actually, you know, the, those big banks collapsed in 2024. There are things that need to get out of the way in order for this to happen. And I think some of those things, you know, maybe there's just a confluence. You know, we, nobody really predicted, well, a few people, but not many people predicted what happened in 2008 when the banks went down. You know, with what's happening in many different parts of the world, it really wouldn't surprise me. We see things like that happening and we need to be ready to, to kind of move into those spaces and to... Be, be pushing them to do, to, to do things differently. I think, I think we're in a different place than we were then as well because uh, public awareness is much higher. The war in Ukraine and people's understanding about energy dependency and, and, and how vulnerable we are when we, when we really depend on globalization in that kind of a way. Um, but also I, I, I think it's like, it, it's why I I'm always so excited about coming to speak with you guys is that this couldn't happen without artists and creative people. And there's often, the, well, there's the arts people over there and there's the scientists over there and there's the ca campaigners over there. And it's like, this needs to be, as I mentioned about, you know, this is, this is all about longing. The poet Rilke had this beautiful saying. He said, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens which is so beautiful, I'm going to say it again because I love saying it. The future must enter into you a long time before it happens. I think we forget that in the work that we do. It's why what you're doing here is so important because we need people to be able to create new North Stars for themselves, I think. So, so my sense is, you know, I don't have a roadmap of how we got, got there because nobody has that roadmap. And if we did, we would all be working on it. My sense is that as well, as well as the things that unraveled very quickly and that we had to respond to, my sense as well is that, is that part of what got us there 
was that we were, we were much more open to creating coalitions with people we would normally not make coalitions with. In permaculture, we call it edge. It's like where two ecosystems meet each other, where a forest meets a meadow, that place is much more biodiverse than the forest or the meadow are. You know? So creating those kind of edges between different things. And I, and I often, well, it was one of the things I was thinking when I was up at the big one was actually a lot of the time when people come from a kind of alternative kind of uh, very sort of left progressive uh, alternative kind of background I'm not sure that we're always the best people at spotting those uh, those unusual partnerships and how we might do them and it was you know, the thing I was just at was a thing called the British Association for Sustainable Sport which is all the organizations in sport across the UK who are really thinking about this stuff as well you know there's conversations happening in so many places and we need to get all those people together I think yeah yeah, I thought one of the most powerful things about what you did there was show and help people to visualise like those things that are happening, you know what I mean? So, mm. therefore, you, I, we could make those sort of things happen in our own little areas and in the work we do. And also, it's very valid to say that the people from a sort of more leftist, uh, anarchist or arty sort of subculture can be quite prejudiced and think that it's only our little subculture that's making changes, whereas actually it is a real big way uh, and we are sort of blocked from it because the media is controlled by those more commercial interests so yeah i was greatly inspired but a lot of the time when you showed the two pictures as well the sort of ink flatty dark dude and the glitter clad uh, angel face you're the one on the left <laughs> yeah like i vibe with the one on the left i'm quite you know i'm quite up for being the sort of the dark uh, the dark side clown splattering out the rainbows here you know, <laughs> but actually there's a lot to be said for um, you know, the glitter, the glitter band angel shining some light uh, over on the dark side as well. So I was greatly inspired by the way you presented all that. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you know, I, 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 I think it's really important to say, you know, that there are lots of um, movements and groups and practitioners that are about like the deep adaptation people and uh, a lot of people who do work around climate grief and so on, who, you know, that question of, well, what if we don't make it? And really sitting and with the work Joanna Macy does, you know, really sitting with that question of what if we don't make it is really important and powerful work. But I think if we also don't make space for well, what if we do, then we create a kind of a bit of a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, really. Well, everyone can, under, everyone can imagine the end of the world, can't they? Because of the, the movies and everything, everyone's got like Armageddon, like real fear for everyone, whereas... Yeah, it's really hard to think of a film. People often say, well, okay, so can you think of a film that is about, that is about the kind of future that you're talking about? And it's really hard to think of. The, the closest I ever get is Wallace and Gromit and the curse of the, <laughs> and the, curse of the were-rabbit. Because everybody, everybody lives in very energy-efficient terraced houses and, this, and everyone rides bicycles everywhere and people have food gardens and they're growing big carrots. And it's like, that's, a, that's the closest I've yet found. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. And I think if that had been named something like what governments name stuff, like a council, I don't think it would have appealed. Like no. It's, it's like it's making people feel excited by the language that's used as well. And I think that there's something in that for sure. Yeah. There was a beautiful thing that I went to in Paris when they have every year they have car free day in Paris where they shut all the streets in a neighborhood in Paris. It was the wettest I ever got. There was like a critical mass bike ride to this thing. I got absolutely soaked. But when we arrived there, they'd renamed all the streets. They'd put up street signs where instead of naming the streets after like colonizing slave owners and generals and people, they'd call them stuff like uh, the street of dance. And there was one that was called La Rue de which, uh, which meant, I can't, my French is terrible, but it basically meant the, 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 the street of improbable, the street of unlikely meetings. <laughs> that was just beautiful. Like, you know, why, I think the, yeah, like the names we use are really important. Why do they have a, a ministry of wonder? Or, you know, those, those kind of words about wonder and awe and, you know, magic, we need a lot more of that kind of thing. It's, often people who work, I think, in local government and national government don't have much awareness of how the language they use can just kill things, stones, what would it, could it be good things are just sort of killed stone dead, really. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, it's one of the, you know, Im imagination has, you, if you want imagination to flourish, there are things you, you need to create the right space for it. So it, 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 there's research about how if people feel like they're under surveillance, it's much harder to be more imaginative, that if uh, the imagination needs space and it needs, uh, you know, it needs access to time outdoors, you know, there's certain things that it needs and we need to recognise those things, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think if you look at somewhere like any time you go to Amsterdam and you walk around in Amsterdam thinking, wow, it's so amazing, the sort of cycle infrastructure and all the bike parks everywhere and all the pedestrianised streets and everything. It wasn't like that in the 1960s. It was one of the most car clogged cities in Europe. What happened was in the 1970s, people mobilised and they just shut the streets and they sat in the streets and they held parties in the streets and they painted their own bike lanes and there was a huge kind of citizen-led movement around taking those spaces back. Um, my sense at the moment is that not much of this is going to come from national government. Where this is going to come from is from communities, local organisations, city governments, local, local governments, finding different ways of working together and finding different ways of bringing in finance. In, in my town in Totnes, I'm part of a project which I've been involved with for quite a long time now, which is called Atmos Totnes, which is the most ambitious community-led development project in the country, where the community has become its own housing developer on an eight-acre empty factory site, where, it, so that, where we're going to do a completely different model for how development happens. Normally, a developer finds a site, they design something that will put the most money in their own pockets, they'll build it, they'll flog it, and then they'll move, send the money to the Cayman Islands and build something else. You know, and actually, in our model, the community designed it, based on its own needs, based in such a way that it'll stimulate and make space for a whole new economy to emerge there. Because, and then because of the, but it's all in community ownership, which means we borrow money for longer from pension funds rather than from banks. And it means that over thir after 30 years, when you've paid back what you've borrowed from the rent coming in from all the different elements of it, you've got a housing scheme in the middle of the town that's generating two, three million pounds every year for the community to decide what it wants to do with. I keep saying to people, imagine if someone had done that 30 years ago. Like, how different would our approach to COVID have been, or to climate, or to youth unemployment in this town, to the housing emergency, if someone had put that into place? So I, so I feel like that's where, that's where I think we should be putting our focus. And then particularly if we can be working with artists and creative people who can just be doing that sort of pop-up tomorrow stuff and un underpinning that with the storytelling and celebrating the things that happen, then... You know, what, what, what I saw with that thing in Liège that I mentioned, the Food Belt project in Liège, when they started that in 2014, for the first four years, the local council thought they were mad. It's never going to work. What a ridiculous idea. You want to build a food belt around the city? That's never going to work. After four years, the municipality could see they were on it and it was growing really fast. So the municipality went to them and said, this is great. How can we help? Tell us what the blockages are, tell us what all the obstacles are, and we'll get them out of the way for you. So the municipality mapped all the land they owned around Liège, had it all tested for contamination, makes it available at low rents to people who want to start projects growing food as part of this project. It's brilliant. And uh, recently, the mayor of Liège made me an honorary citizen of Liège. I got a little medal and everything. I did say to him, thanks for the medal. Could I have a European passport instead? <laughs> and he said, oh, that is not within my powers, Mr. Hopkins, no. But, but he said, you know, actually before that, everybody thought Liège was kind of a bit shit, really. And then now I go everywhere telling this story of what they're doing in Liège. He said, you're like a sort of an informal ambassador for our city. And now everyone thinks Liège is really cool. But I think that that's, that coming together of civil society with the support of a city government uh, and just, you know, if the government won't do it, we need to figure it out on a city scale and just get on with it, I think. Did you ever? Okay. <laughs> uh, 
I think I would go and see the Velvet Underground playing in, uh, <laughs> at the Boston Tea Party in 1968. Have you got a spare seat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my first port of call. Yeah? Um, really inspirational, and um, the Beaver Facts, definitely here for that as well. <laughs> um, really enjoyed that. Um, I was wondering, it's something that kind of has stumped me in the past in this kind of discussion, is um, the, like, the talk of car-free cities and um, spaces where people are walking on easy bikes. Um, is there like anyone you'd point to that kind of centres the experience of people who might not have the accessibility to use um, feet or a bike? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you look at places like, so I think the Dutch, so that, that, that figure that I said about how for every billion, every billion pounds we spend on cycling infrastructure, it saves 38 billion pounds. That's, that's already policy in the Netherlands. They spend half a billion euros every year because it saves them 19 billion euros every year off, off their health bill, which I just think is such an enlightened way of looking at things. And when you go to Utrecht, you go to Rotterdam, which you can cycle all around Rotterdam. You don't even come, you're not even, ne you, if you wanted to touch a car, you couldn't all the way around. It's so safe and just amazing. Oh, no, sorry, I meant for people who might not yeah. be able to bike. Yeah, 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 so, but, but we've but d designed into that is accessibility for people who need who need that absolutely so it's not like it's not like the city is completely inaccessible for people who need to be picked up or taken places or who need deliveries it's just that it's just the, where we need to get to i think is there was that i can't remember who said it but there was that saying about you know a, a civilized society is one where the rich man takes the bus rather than the poor person needing a car you know, and, and so it means that you get to a stage where if you live in a city, you have, it would be mad. Why would you waste money having a car that you couldn't really take anywhere anyway? And the public transport's amazing. And, and, and of course, accessibility needs to be designed into that. But what they found in the, in, in the Netherlands is that 54% of people own a bike. And on average, people in the Netherlands live uh, six months longer than the European average because of that. So it's also a way of bringing up the, the overall health. But yeah, absolutely, sometimes people... Sometimes people are quite resistant to the idea of moving away from car dependency because they have, uh, they have accessibility needs, but there's, it's completely doable. There's a couple called uh, Chris and Melissa Brundtland who, wrote, who write books about car-free cities and they do a lot in there about uh, ensuring those cities remain accessible to people. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, I mean. I think the thing is that really, you know, it, it's not like, it's not like they, uh, they don't have other options. You know, Shell and BP, if Shell and BP had any fibre of moral integrity in what they do, they could very easily redesign themselves within a short period of time to move away from being fossil fuel companies to being renewable energy companies. They could absolutely do that. That's not, and, and they could still be very profitable and they could still operate in a different way. The problem is, so Mariame Cabo, who's one of my great heroes, prison abolition activist in the United States, she says, we live in a system that has been locked into a false sense of inevitability. So the problem with Shell and BP is a lack of imagination and an inability to see themselves as being anything other, doing anything other than they've always done. We're an oil and gas company, we extract oil and gas, we'll pay some PR people to pretend to get people to believe that we love wind turbines, but it's like less than 4% of our business and we're about oil and gas. They, there is, you know, the, 
I think it's so in terms of a lot of those companies, we can't do like what happened with slavery where we pay them or we were still paying slavery off like six or seven years ago, it's disgraceful. So we can't bail those companies out even though there's already going to be a lot of big lawsuits now where oil and gas companies are kicking back again, when national governments have decarbonisation strategies. There's a British oil company at the moment suing the Italian government who said as part of our decarbonisation plan you can't extract oil from there and they're suing the Italian government. So there will be a lot of that stuff going on. But we also need to, you know, like with the divestment movement, with Extinction Rebellion, with a lot of the, the, the stuff that's going on now, is just to make oil and gas companies and the way they behave sort of a social pariah and really kind of isolated in that way. And, uh, and, to, be, and to be trying to get and to say, well, you, you could be doing something. All, of the, all those companies, there's no reason why banks and, the, and the, the insurance companies who insure oil and gas exploration and who keep all of that nonsense going, they don't need to be doing that. They, they, they could still be a profitable companies. You know, money can move from one place to another, and that's, so there's big movements now around divestment and the carbon bubble and all of that sort of stuff, which is about be the, you don't, what you don't want to be is the last person still in oil. You want to be among the first people who got out and did something else. And so those kind of messages we need to be getting into people as well. Yeah. But again, I'm not saying any of this is, 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 is going to be massively easy. But I think it's the people, you know, it's like when, when, when the internet started, you know, there were some people who were like, oh, I don't understand what this is. And there were some people who moved in and, and started all the different things. You know, you, you want to be the first people to follow the move and it's going to be exactly the same with the shift towards a lower carbon society. Last one. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm curious to hear more about transportation and inclement weather in places that are particularly frigid. I lived in Minneapolis that gets very cold. It's negative 60 Fahrenheit in the winter. Um, and in those situations, bikes aren't as practical. Um, there's a lot of snow and things like that. So I know that the city has adopted a lot of um, what they call skyways that connect their buildings so you can walk from one end to the other of the city center without leaving buildings. But um, in, in winter situations where that's not possible, what are like, some other transportation alternatives? Well, I mean, uh, I mean I've been to Sweden when it, and it gets very, very cold in Sweden. And uh, just pe people cycle a lot of the year in, in, in Sweden there because they have good, they, they keep it all gritted and free of snow and ice and stuff. I mean, it's a bit like here, you know, when you get a little bit of snow and all the trains stop running and the cars stop running. Like where, where I am, I, when it gets below a certain temperature, it's hard to cycle because there's black ice and I've come off a few times and you get a bit wary about it. But in Sweden, they cycle when the snow's up here. So there must be ways of doing it. And most of the countries that are doing the most enlightened stuff are like, like in Amsterdam is wetter and less, more inclement uh, than here. Um, but, but, but we also need like good trams and good public transport infrastructure that enables people to get around in other ways, but also I think electric bikes and those technologies have come on a long, long way and, and are helping to make cycling much more accessible for a lot more people yeah. too. And just to say thank you all so much for what you do, like here, in terms of the work you do to, to sort of expand people's imagination. And I've never been to Boomtown, much to my shame, but my kids have always, and they always come back with great stories about how it's like, oh, it's amazing, Dad. you'd love it, Dad. You'd love it. It's all about imagination, and you go into these places, and there's things happening, and it's all just amazing. And so, like, for the, for the surface service that you guys do to the imagination, thank you so much. And thanks for having me.